Overlord is a story like no other, and today I just want to talk about why Overlord has such an impact, and why the story captivates so many, myself included, while other anime have one or two good seasons and then lose all interest. I want to start with something that many have noticed, namely its incredible consistency. Normally, in any anime, no matter how strong the villain is, with the power of friendship and teamwork, the evil is fought and banished because love is stronger than hate, and in the end, the good always wins. This is also the case in Overlord, as Ains Ulgaon's Sorcerer Kingdom rewrites history to its liking. Seriously though, standing on the morally right side and being the underdog doesn't help you in Overlord at all. The story does not suddenly take your side or favor you. You do not awaken some hidden power within you to fight the evil, instead you die, if you're lucky. In Overlord, political power, power politics, intrigues, and power imbalances are important and determine actions and who comes out on top, not wishful thinking. The plot is completely logically constructed and does not look at how things should be and who the good guy is that must win. Instead, each character behaves according to their nature, has strengths and weaknesses, and finds themselves in certain situations, with all subsequent events logically built upon that. Unlike in Game of Thrones, where Daenerys does not go to King's Landing with three dragons and a hundred thousand men to kill the evil queen because Tyrion apparently had an aneurysm that halved his IQ, in Overlord, the Dark Young coldly exterminates a peasant army in sight of a so-called ally to counter an empire's intrigue by demonstrating overwhelming power. This even caused the supposedly allied Baharuth Empire's legions to panic, flee in disgrace, and beg their emperor never to start a war with the Sorcerer Kingdom and always seek a diplomatic solution, significantly undermining the plan to unite the world against Ains. Overlord does not shy away from the consequences of the protagonist's power. He has the power to annihilate entire countries and feels no pity for the living anymore. Thus, he uses it when the situation demands it. The atrocities that exist in the world of Overlord are also not glossed over or sugarcoated, except perhaps by us who still talk about the happy farm, and they are neither censored nor prettied up, just shown as the logical consequence of actions, and especially described in detail in the books. The new Overlord movie also does not shy away from depicting some of the most brutal scenes from the books. Violence is not an end in itself. It is not a gore fest or anything like that. It is just raw and realistic, even if the world is in a high fantasy setting. Moreover, it is clear how good the world building is. Overlord is not your standard isekai just because of its story, but the world has depth. It is not shallow world building that falls apart under close inspection, but something that can be thoroughly examined and truly has more than meets the eye. The whole world is internally consistent and logically constructed. On this channel, I said over half a decade ago that the theocracy of Slain was likely behind the Adventurer's Guild, simply because the guild's goal is to protect humanity from its predators, which is 100% in line with the theocracy, which more or less does the same thing. And I was right, not because I'm so good at predicting the future, but because the world is so well constructed that you can see the next brick coming, like in Tetris. I just want to give a few examples of pretty obscure lore that fits well together. Why has the dwarves' runecraft magic been gradually replaced by tear magic over the last 200 years? Well, they had a friendship treaty with the young Baharuth Empire, and by that time Fluter Paradine was already the court magician in the still young empire. In other words, even back then, the nation was increasingly influenced by magic, which must have affected the dwarves. Why do dark elves no longer live in the great forest of Tob? Probably because of the tree monster Zytelk. Why does Clementine wear bikini armor made from the tags of fallen adventurers? because she's a sadist who gets off on scaring and horrifying people and because she would never have gotten past Zeshi, who guards her proper armor. Why is the kingdom so decadent? Because it never had to take care of its defense and economy, while the empire had to constantly fight for survival and would have collapsed multiple times without Fluter. Why was Albedo so surprised by Philip's actions? Because the actions of a clever person like Yerkniv are easier to predict than the foolish actions of a single complete idiot. It's so brilliant to see how the world effortlessly fits together and how everything is interconnected. This is why one can speculate about the reason why the players came into the new world, how the theocracy was 500 years ago when it was led by Sershana, and so much more. 
But let's move on to the next point. Overlord has something that many anime don't manage to incorporate. An incredibly good cast of side characters who are interesting, can stand on their own, and make you want to know more about them. What is up with this Imperial Knight and her purpose? What deal does she have with Yurkniev? What will happen with Fluter? Will he become an Elder Lich? What will become of Nea Baraha? How will the story of the Golden Princess end? What is Albedo planning? Does Demiurge know what Albedo is planning? What role will Pandora's actor play? What does the Platinum Dragon Lord plan? How will Ains fight against him? What about Draudulon Auriculus and her Dragon Kingdom? What's next for Skama Albedo and her perverse priestess? What will become of Zeshi? What about the rest of the Black Scripture? What will happen to the Theocracy now that Ains knows they were behind the attack on Shaltir Bloodfallen? And so much more. The characters in the Kingdom of Riestes alone are so well written and interesting that you could tell a good story just from their perspective. The impending civil war, the Blue Roses and their connection to Platinum through Rigrit, Evelai's story, the Eight Fingers and how they drive the kingdom into the Abyss, Azuth Aindra and his armor, Emperor Jerkniv as an incredibly good ruler and opponent, the succession dispute and people like Enri Emmet, who are at the very bottom and have to live with the consequences of this politics or die because of them. Someone like Lachius, Evelai, or even Climb could all be the main character. Especially since Climb does not win in the end with the power of friendship but is tricked, incapacitated, and then tamed by Renner. This is a nice subversion at the end, followed by a lot of submission. Only a few other anime and manga, like One Piece or Mushoku Tensei, manage this. That's why everyone finds a character they can sympathize with, or at least a Pleiades they find hot and a character they hate and finally want to see happy farmed. Furthermore, Overlord does something that many anime don't do. It remains true to the core thesis, the premise, the reason why one originally started watching or reading Overlord. The shield hero from Legend of the Shield Hero initially is the total outsider, unjustly despised and ostracized by society, who has to clear his name and, due to his treatment, has become morally gray, doing both good and bad things. Additionally, as the shield hero, without someone to go on the offensive, he is practically useless, making his outsider role even more fatal for him. However, these main conflicts were relatively quickly resolved, and the rest is then standard isekai fare. What initially attracted one to shield hero is no longer there, except for Raftalia. Overlord, on the other hand, maintains the tension. Ainz is still lonely and his inner conflict is still not resolved. He hasn't found any of his friends. No one except maybe one person can see behind his facade as the undead overlord, and Ains still doesn't know who was behind the attack on Shaltir Bloodfallen. At least not in the anime, and in the light novel, the actual conflict with the theocracy only begins in the upcoming volume 17. The first conscious contact with the Platinum Dragonlord, disguised as Riku Aganea, only happened in volume 14 or at the end of season 4. One of the reasons why the involvement of Ains is so characteristic and doesn't feel like a typical deus ex machina moment is because we empathize and suffer with the characters. Sebas's hands were tied for almost two volumes before Nazarick moved out with full force and punished and subdued the Eight Fingers. During that time, we got the climb story arc. Renner was officially introduced as the deranged Yandere princess. Several other characters like Evelai, Gazef, and Revan had important scenes and the weaknesses and inherent mortality of these side characters made it still exciting to see what would happen and who would survive until Ains intervened. Ains indeed has the power to resurrect someone, like climb after the lost duel against him. But why should he waste valuable resources if it doesn't benefit him? At Enri's parents' grave and their funeral, it was clear that Ains has no interest in wasting resources that could serve Nazar just to bring back the parents of a then insignificant peasant girl. At the same time, Ains does not necessarily differentiate well between friend and foe. People who have read Volume 12 will know what I mean. In other words, even if everyone could be resurrected at any time, everyone can also die at any time, as long as they are weak enough. Ains usually won't care about the loss, but rather think about how to use their end profitably, as in the case of the Swords of Darkness. In other words, the anime does not shy away from showing morally gray or evil characters without condemning them through the story, and making them lose because what they do is evil. 
Overlord's story shows, illustrates, and describes what happens instead of condemning and preaching what is right and wrong. Okay, bye.